The Amityville horror case is one of, if not the greatest paranormal case of all time, and has introduced millions to paranormal phenomena. Countless movies have been made and countless books have been written, but what really happened during those 28 days the Lutz family lived in the home? And was Ronald DeFeo Jr. influenced by evil spirits to kill his family at 3.15 in the morning in November of 1974? Today, let's take a look at the history of the town, the land, the people, and the house to see if we can answer the real Amityville horror. Amityville is a village in the town of Babylon in Suffolk County, New York, and settlers first visited the Amityville area in 1653 due to its location to a source of salt hay for use as animal fodder. Chief Wyandotte granted the first deed to land in Amityville in 1658. The area was originally called Huntington West Neck South, and according to village lore, the name was changed in 1846 when residents were working to establish its new post office. The meeting turned into Bedlam, and one participant was said to exclaim, What this meeting needs is some amity. Another version says the name was first suggested by mill owner Samuel Ireland to name the town for his boat, the Amity. In the early 1900s, Amityville was a popular tourist destination with large hotels on the bay and large homes. Annie Oakley was said to be a frequent guest of vaudevillian Fred Stone. Will Rogers had a home across Clocks Boulevard from Stone, and gangster Al Capone also had a house in the community. There is a legend that says the Native American tribe that inhabited the area Amityville is located came from Egypt, and that there were pyramids found in the area that were attributed as burial mounds. Thomas Jefferson came to Suffolk County to study the language of the Montauks, the local Native American tribe. He traveled through Amityville on the South Road, which was originally a Native American path. In the East County, he made a record of their language because there was some belief that they were descendant from Egyptians who crossed the Atlantic. Long Island was divided between the Dutch and the English. Unlike the English, the Dutch did not get along with the Native Americans. Amityville was located right on the border between the Dutch and English territory, and the Dutch did not have enough troops, so they hired an Englishman named John Underhill to help them. John Underhill was a very good Indian fighter, and in 1644, he was brought in to fight the Native Americans at their stronghold. He killed 120 of them in the only major Native American battle on Long Island. For this, Underhill was paid 25,000 guilders by Governor William Kift. In the 19th century, local historian Samuel Jones wrote, After the Battle of Fort Neck, the weather became very cold, and the wind north-southwest, Captain Underhill and his men collected the bodies and threw them in a heap on the brow of the hill, and then sat down on the leeward side of the heap to eat their breakfast. When this part of the county came to be settled, the highway across the neck passed directly over the spot where it was said the heap of Native Americans lay and the earth in that spot was more remarkably different from the ground about it, being strongly tinged with a reddish cast where the old people said was occasioned by the blood of the Indians. The location of the killing was in Fort Neck, about one and a half miles from the Amityville Whorehouse at the corner of Merrick Road and Cedar Shore Road. In 1935, the bones of 24 people were dug up at the site. So, there is some basis to the legend of a Native American chief wanting revenge, and who knows what else happened in the area that wasn't documented. So now that we know some of the background of the area, let's take a look at the DeFeo family. Let's take a look at a series of events shortly before the murders to give us an idea of the kind of environment the DeFeo house was. Michael Brigante Sr. and his father's uncle, Peter DeFeo, were identified by police as a captain in the Vito Genovese crime family. By late 1974, Ryan DeFeo said he was spending much of his time at his alleged wife Geraldine's home in El Buran and very little in Amityville. I was never home, he said. If I wasn't with Jerry, I'd be out running around someplace. On the evening of November 12, 1974, DeFeo said he was in El Buran with Geraldine, her children, and her brother. I was drinking all day with her brother, he said. I was playing around with the heroin, which was my regular. At about 8 p.m., Louis DeFeo called. She wanted her son home right away. She was screaming, Geraldine said. She said, Dawn's fighting with Ronnie Sr. The fight was triggered by Dawn's desire to move to Florida with her boyfriend, DeFeo claims. Before the murders, Dawn spoke to a classmate whose mother cleaned the DeFeo house. She asked Nonowitz to take her with her to Florida. She asked me numerous times, but Ronnie Sr. would not allow her to go to Florida with him, DeFeo said. 
And it was also said that Louise's close relationship with her father, Michael Briganti Sr., and the family's dependence on him was extremely important. Briganti paid the mortgage on the Amityville house, employed both Ronald Sr. and Jr. at his Buick dealership in Brooklyn, and showered his daughter with gifts. When she asked for a bottle of perfume, her father would send a case. When she asked for a washer dryer, he bought her two. Geraldine said that even Butch, despite his animosity towards his father, once said, How the heck can my father be a man when her father's always there? In the last weeks of her life, Louis DeFeo became more and more upset for a variety of reasons, including her husband's violence and what she considered his dishonesty at the car dealership. They were ready to get a divorce, DeFeo said of his parents. She wanted to die, said Linnea Nunowitz, Louise's housekeeper and confidant. She wanted to put her head in the oven. And just a short time before she died, Louise DeFeo had a premonition, Nunowitz said. She said to me, Lynn, I'm preparing you. Something so tragic is about to happen. DeFeo said, my mother's out of her mind. She's running around making statements that you're all better off dead. When she phoned on November 12th and asked that DeFeo come home, he of Ramadan drove to Amityville. My brother-in-law came home with me to the house because I was a mess, DeFeo said. He said they found his father and sister embroiled in a long, angry quarrel. Then she picked up a knife and tried to kill him. I took the knife away from her. He said he gave her the car keys and told her to disappear and cool off. Evidence was later submitted to the court by the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office suggesting that Rich Ramadan did not exist and that Geraldine Gates was living in upstate New York, married to someone else at the time of the murders. Geraldine Gates did not testify at this hearing because the authorities had already confronted her about the false claims and in 1992 secured a statement under oath where she admitted Ramado was fictitious and that she actually didn't marry DeFeo until 1989 in anticipation of the filing of the 440 motion. One important thing I should add also about this is that a lot of information comes from Ronald DeFeo Jr., who has been known to change his story several times. So whether or not all of this happened exactly as described isn't known, but it does paint the picture of a very troubled family semi-ruled by an angry Ronald DeFeo Sr., but really ruled by Michael Briganti Sr. The house also had a history of being haunted even while the DeFeos lived in the house and an exorcism was carried out in the home at the urgence of Ronnie DeFeo Jr. and he fled the home shortly after. So even before the Lutzes moved in, long before the Lutzes moved in, before the murders occurred, this place had a reputation, reputation for being a home that is infested with evil demonic entities. In the early morning hours of November 13, 1974, the patrons of Henry's Bar, a tavern located at the corner of Merrick Road and Ocean Avenue in Amityville, chatted while sipping their beers and cocktails. At 6.30 p.m., Ronnie DeFeo Jr. opened the door to the bar and yelled, You've got to help me. I think my mother and father are shot. One of the patrons seated at the bar was Robert Bobby Kiske, an out-of-town work brick mason and Butch's best friend. Bobby raced to his friend who had fallen to his knees. Crying hysterically, Butch again pleaded for help. Bobby, you've got to help me. Somebody shot my mother and father. Butch got to his feet and called for others at the bar to follow him. Bobby and him back to the house and four other men joined them as they raced to the home. The house was quiet, except for the barking of Shaggy, the DeFeo sheepdog, who was tied up to the inside of the kitchen's back door. With Bobby in the lead, the five men hurried upstairs to the second floor. Bobby, a regular visitor to DeFeo household, knew exactly where the master bedroom was located. As they reached the second floor, they were overwhelmed with the stench of death. Bobby stopped at the doorway to the master bedroom and hit the light switch. Before him lay Ronald Joseph DeFeo Sr. and his wife, Louise DeFeo, dead in their beds. Seeing that Bobby was ready to pass out, the other men led him downstairs, past the life-size portraits of family members that hung on the staircase wall. John Altieri remained on the second floor and checked out the northeast bedroom. On opposite sides of the room lay the bodies of two young boys, face down like their parents. In the bed on the left lay the body of John DeFeo, nine years old. He could not pinpoint the bullet hole in John's back since the New York Knicks sweatshirt he was wearing was covered in blood. In the other bed lay John's brother, Mark DeFeo. 
Next up, Mark's bed was a pair of crutches and a plain gray wheelchair. The boy had recently suffered a football injury and needed their assistance to get around. At the foot of his bed lay a crumpled up green and yellow bedspread and an orange blanket. This time he could make out a wound, a single bullet hole in the center of the boy's back. Seeing more than he wanted, he left the room and rejoined the others on the ground floor. There, Joe Yeswolf called 911. In the early morning hours of November 13, 1974, six members of the DeFeo family were slain in their beds with a 35 caliber rifle. 23-year-old Ronald Butch DeFeo Jr., the eldest child, confessed to murdering his entire family in cold blood. All his family, including his parents, his bro siblings, and his brothers, were all dead. DeFeo has said that he heard voices in the home telling him to murder his parents, brothers, and sister. How everything went down that night isn't known because Ronnie DeFeo Jr. has changed his stories numerous times. But there is evidence that Dawn, his sister, may have assisted him in some of the murders before she was killed. Something that never made sense to me about the murders is that no one in the house or in the neighborhood heard any gunshots at all. A 35 caliber rifle is a very loud gun and someone should have heard something. It's almost impossible that especially the people in the house could not have heard the guns going off. And what's also interesting is the evidence that Dawn actually assisted is that on her dress there was dry gunpowder which some people say was leaked out of the barrel of the rifle. But what's also interesting is in her bed and in her bedroom there's no blood as to where on the in the other rooms there's blood on the headboards there's blood on the dressers different places like that signaling you know this is where they were shot but with dawn there was none it was a completely clean scene so what some detectives are thinking is that she was probably killed in some other part of the house which there was another part of the house where blood was found which kind of you know matched the look of a gunshot and then she was probably moved so why she was moved to her bedroom and why she was in another part of the house isn't exactly known and another version that ronnie defeo jr told of the story is he was tripping out that night he was doing drugs and he saw this dark figure approach him with the rifle hand it to him and command him to kill his family and neighbors around the home who knew the DeFeos, they said that it was very common for Don to walk around the house late at night with a black nightgown on. So some people are saying that where he was in a drugged out state, it could have been Don telling him to do this. But once again, we may never know the truth because the story keeps changing and most of the people that were there that night are dead. On January 15, 1975, Butch's then lawyer, Jacob Siegfried, motioned the court to be permitted the right to examine, inspect, copy, photograph, or make and take photostatic copies of the original notes of the arresting officers, together with police reports containing statements of the witnesses. Siegfried insisted these terms were crucial, saying the defendant was deprived of his right to a preliminary hearing in the district court by the district attorney's actions in presenting the case directly to the grand jury. Regardless, the court did not believe these items necessary for Butch's defense, and on March 11, 1975, presiding judge John Jones denied the request. With little choice remaining, Siegfried later filed a notion of defense of mental disease or defect for his client. Since the defense had been denied an equal opportunity to have the same reports, records, and photos that the prosecution had in its possession, there was only one choice left, an insanity plea. Butch did not want his sanity questioned, and he threatened to strangle Siegfried. With little recourse and after spending more than $40,000 on attorneys, Michael Briganti Sr. told his grandson, Sweetheart, your dime is played out. This meant that Butch would have to use a court-appointed attorney. On July 7, 1975, William Weber was assigned by the clerk of the Suffolk County Court to represent Butch in his trial. On July 29, 1975, Judge Ernest Signorelli, who was at the time presiding over the DeFeo trial, had a conference between Butch, prosecuting attorney Gerald Sullivan, and William Weber. The major concern was that there were no objections to Weber's playing an active role 
and Judge Signorelli's campaign to be elected to the surrogate court. After everyone agreed Weber's role in Judge Signorelli's campaign did not pose a problem, the matter of an insanity defense came up. He was later given six life sentences, and today Ronald DeFeo Jr. is still serving time in a New York prison. The Lutzes were owners of a successful multi-generational family business. Though they had put a great deal of their money into the house, they were not known to be in deep financial trouble, nor were they known to be storytellers, scam artists, or oddballs. They were, by all accounts, a normal young couple trying to raise their children. A Catholic priest arrived when the Lutz family moved in while they were unpacking to bless the family home. As the priest made his way upstairs to the second floor, entering the bedroom which had formerly belonged to Mark and John DeFeo, he began sprinkling holy water, at which point an unseen force told the priest to get out, which he hastily did. The priest did not tell the Lutz family about the voice, but he did warn them, do not use the upstairs room as a bedroom and do not let anyone sleep in there. George Lutz was played by a constant chill and spent all of his time feeding the fireplace. George had also noticed a change in his grooming habits and his wife and Kathy's health declined drastically. The Lutz's daughter began spending all of her time in her room, playing with an imaginary friend. She described her friend as a red-eyed pig called Jody, who could transform not only shape, but size. And sometimes Jody was also reported to be larger than the house. Jody was also claimed that she could not be seen by anyone unless she wanted them to and that she had the power to do anything she wanted at any time to anyone regardless of who tried to stop her. George Lutz was said to wake up at 3.15 a.m. every morning, which was around the time Ronnie DeFeo carried out his murders. A nearby garage door opening and closing, an invisible spirit knocking a knife down the kitchen, a pig-like creature staring down at George Lutz and his son Daniel from a window, George waking up to his wife Kathy levitating off their bed, and sons Daniel and Christopher also levitating together in their beds were just some of the things that they encountered during the early stages of living in the home. It was also reported that as time went by in the home, George Lutz started to take on the characteristics and appearance of Ronnie DeFeo Jr., and he would have violent fits of rage out of nowhere. The final night was reported to be the worst. Banging and knocking as loud as marching bands emanated throughout the home. Furniture being moved by its own accord and the children being terrorized in the home occurred as well. After 28 days in the Amityville house, the Lutz family claimed they could take no more. They grabbed only a few belongings and fled the house, taking shelter at Kathy Lutz's mother's home in nearby Babylon. After telling their story, George and Kathy took a lie detector test to prove their innocence. They both passed. Something else that's very interesting to note is the Lutz family had a family connection to some occult practices. And there was a history in their family as well of paranormal activity occurring. Twenty days after the Lutz family fled the Amityville house, paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren were called in by Marvin Scott, a news reporter with Channel 5 New York who had covered the Amityville story and worked on a prior investigation with the Warrens. A team of reporters, Investigators and parapsychologists were assembled by Ed Warren and met at the home at 112 Ocean Avenue. The Lutz family refused to re-enter the home during the investigation, and George Lutz met Ed and Lorraine Warren at a pizza parlor a few miles away from the home to tell his story. During the investigation, Ed Warren was physically pushed to the floor while using religious provocation in the basement. Lorraine Warren was also overwhelmed by the sense of a demonic presence and was plagued by her psychic impressions of the DeFeo family's bodies laid along the floor covered in white sheets and a sense of physically being pushed back. The research team also captured a famous image of a spirit that appeared as a little boy peering from the second floor. The land was also found to be used by John Ketchum. John Ketchum was a practicing black magician and had a cottage on the land prior to the construction of the Dutch colonial house in 1924. John requested that his remains be buried on the property and it's said they remain there to this day. Ed Warren said that the home was infested with diabolic entities and that the evil presence in the home is what led to Ronnie DeFeo Jr. to kill his family. 
Other investigators, such as Hans Holzer, went in about a month and a half later, and he reported very little paranormal activity, although his medium, as I stated earlier in the video, did pick up some premonitions and some visuals of terrible things that had happened when the Native Americans lived on the land. The Amityville Horror Case is full of legend, controversy, tragedy, rumors, history, and in this video I presented many facts and stories of what happened in the area to the DeFeos, the Lutzes, and the investigation by Ed and Lorraine Warren. There are things that I didn't cover in this and I will leave the rest of the case to you, the viewer, to do your own research and reach your own conclusions as to what really happened in the home. So Amityville Horror is my favorite paranormal case of all time. And I grew up with my parents always talking about this case because this was the case that, you know, fascinated them all their lives. And I've always wanted to go investigate Amityville because in my personal opinion, I do believe that there was a spiritual presence that did have something to do with the DeFeo murders. As for whether or not it caused Ronnie DeFeo to commit the murders, I don't know. I think it's a mix of the activity that had happened to him prior messing with his mind had more to do with him going over the edge and committing the murders than a spirit actually assisting him that night. Just like I also believe the theory that Dawn helped him kill his family. And it said that DeFeo, he admitted to killing his parents, which is something he and Dawn had agreed to do. And that when Dawn started killing the children because they were witnesses, that's when DeFeo got mad and there was a struggle between them to which DeFeo accidentally shot Dawn. As for once again, as I stated earlier, we don't truly know what happened. And at the end of the day, we may never know the truth about the Amityville Horror, but I still think the Lusses were telling the truth. That house at 112 Ocean Avenue is haunted.